On the morning of April 15th, 1912, at around 2.15 a.m., the end had come for RMS Titanic. As passengers and crews struggled around the base of the number one funnel to free and fill the lifeboats there, the ship took a dive down by the head and a wave washed up the boat deck. Suddenly, the desperate crowd was presented with a fresh misery. The forward funnel, the height of a five-story building, came crashing down on their heads. Today, we're all familiar with the sight of Titanic's funnels. The four black and buff coloured smokestacks have become something of an icon synonymous with the great ship itself. But what were they made of? How did they work, and why did they collapse as the ship sank? Other ships of the time sank, like Lusitania, and their funnels stayed in place until they hit the sea floor. What was it about Titanic's that made them come down? Today, we'll analyse the funnels, how they were made, how they worked, and the forces at play that caused them to fall. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. This is a guide to Titanic's funnels and why they collapsed. To understand why Titanic had four funnels at all, and why they were so big, we need to delve a little bit into the history behind these things. And don't worry, I promise you, it's an interesting story. In the early days of steam, ships carried one or two small boilers to generate the steam, so only a single chimney-styled smokestack was required. But then, as vessels grew in size and complexity, the number of horsepower required to move each ship increased, and so did the number of boilers. The earliest steamships had one or maybe two funnels, but in 1859, a new ship set to sea with no fewer than five of the things. There was a good reason for this. The SS Great Eastern was ridiculously big. In 1857, the biggest ship in the world was a steamer called Adriatic, which was about 354 feet or 108 meters long and 3,670 gross registered tons. And then a year later, Great Eastern was launched at 692 feet that's 211 metres long, and 18,915 gross registered tonnes. Now that is a ridiculous jump in size. The ship was the brainchild of the revolutionary engineer Isambard Brunel, a legend and industrialist, and his ship, which he nicknamed his Great Babe, was an absolute outlier. Moving a ship that large through the water needed a similarly immense amount of horsepower. She was fitted with four steam engines for the paddles, and another for her propeller, giving her an impressive speed of 14 knots. That's 26 kilometers per hour, or 16 miles per hour. It was more than just impressive engineering for the time. It was achieved by supplying Great Eastern's engines with a monumental amount of coal and boilers to burn it and make the steam. The result was a then unheard of amount of 10 massive boilers producing both the required steam and a heap of thick, black, acrid coal smoke. Now, venting this up and out of the ship was the job of the funnels, and the larger number of boilers simply meant there needed to be more funnels to deal with the smoke. The ten boilers were each paired to a funnel, resulting in the impressive array of five thin smokestacks, each one tall enough to ensure the worst of the smoke would pass harmlessly over passengers' heads on deck. Now this ship is nothing short of an engineering marvel, but at the time, Great Eastern was actually mocked for its then ridiculous size and also for the number of funnels that it carried. It was just 50 or 60 years ahead of its time, and Brunel would have the last laugh because decades later, in the 1890s, German shipbuilders used essentially the same layout to create the blueprint for the world's first four-funneled liner, the Kaiser Wilhelm der Grosse. Now, obviously this was to do with the number of boilers and the speed that the ship needed to hit, but it caused a sensation with its four huge smokestacks, and carrying that many funnels became de rigueur for the most prestigious passenger ships on the Atlantic. Cunard Line were quick to follow up a few years later with their own pair of four funneled superliners, Lusitania and Mauritania, and then it was White Star Line's turn. Now we understand why Titanic had four funnels. It was clearly to do with the arrangement and the layout of the boilers. The first three funnels were coupled to boilers and dealt with the smoke and fumes. But there's actually been a bit of a myth surrounding the fourth funnel, that it was just a dummy only added for looks. If we cut Titanic down the middle, you can see that the fourth funnel really does sit over a part of the ship dense with machinery, the turbine engine room. Other ships of the day, like Kaiser Wilhelm de Grosse, provided deep shafts to ventilate the engine rooms and provide an exit for warm air. Titanic had one just like it over her main engine room too. 
But there was a peculiarity in Titanic's design that made her different to other ships. She had a third engine, a steam turbine that was different to her main engines. It needed its own ventilation as well. Now, White Star could have just installed another shaft or a dense pack of ventilators designed to draw in fresh air. But obviously that wouldn't work with the ship's balance. So the inclusion of a funnel as a ventilator here was, in that sense, for aesthetics. But the fourth funnel also vented smoke from two different key areas. The fireplace and the first class smoking room here, but more crucially the massive galleys for the various dining saloons. That smoke from the ovens too needed to be lifted high over the heads of passengers, and the fourth funnel did the job. We'll have a closer look at how they did so shortly, but that was a brief explanation of how, and why, Titanic got her four funnels. Now funnels also performed a secondary job of marketing their owners. A ship's funnels are arguably the vessel's most identifiable feature, and this was especially true in Titanic's era, when they were proudly painted in their company's colours. Now it was an easy marketing opportunity, and paint schemes of all sorts were applied to make the company's fleet stand out. But even this idea was a relatively new one. Smokestacks hadn't even really been around that long because steamships had only become widespread some 50 or 60 years earlier in the mid 1800s. Early on, the stacks were usually painted black to hide the soot from all the thick coal smoke that was spewing out of them, but then something changed. One of the early steamship adopters was the famous Cunard Line, and their bright vermilion funnels and black bands soon became an icon of the transatlantic trade. Funnels, as we'll soon explore in more detail, are extremely hot, and they're made of very thin metal, so they need to be protected against corrosion and damage. In the early days of the steamship, engineer Robert Napier was grappling with the issue of painting a funnel. Regular paint would flake right off because of the heat. He patented a special mixture of buttermilk and red ochre, a weird mix that actually worked brilliantly because the heat of the funnel would then self-bake the concoction on, and therefore make it stronger and more resilient. It resulted in a bright orange-red colour that soon was passed on to his business partner, a man named Samuel Cunard, who adopted it for his ships. The colour soon became known as Cunard Red, and the concept of brand recognition through the steamship's funnel colours was cemented. The idea took off as more and more steamship companies were founded and wanted to identify their ships from the pack. Cunard Line's great rival, the White Star Line, adopted their own recognisable colour scheme, a colour known as White Star Buff that was somewhere between a warm yellow and a light tan brown, with a black top for the soot. Titanic carried those four immense funnels, each painted in the immediately recognisable White Star Buff paint scheme. So now we know the history behind why Titanic had so many funnels and why they looked the way they did, we need to deep dive into some engineering behind their function because this gives us some clues as to why they might have failed on the night of the sinking. Well it turns out that Titanic's funnels as viewed from the outside were, if you'll forgive the pun, just the tip of the iceberg. The entire structure was complex and ran deep into the bowels of the ship. We'll start down here in the boiler rooms where coal is burnt to boil water and generate huge amounts of steam. The steam is vented under pressure into the engines, but the excess smoke from the burning coal has nowhere to go. We already knew that, the Titanic's funnels served to vent the gases and the smoke, but they also helped the boilers burn hotter in the first place and more efficiently purely because of their massive size. Now we've covered this already in more detail in our video outlining the workings of Titanic's engines, but essentially a fire needs oxygen to burn well, and getting oxygen into the bottom of a ship 10 stories below the upper deck is something of a challenge. Titanic used large fans called Stokehold fans to suck in gallons of air from above and feed it directly into the boiler rooms themselves. They didn't feed the fires in the boilers directly, Instead, the boiler furnaces would draw the air in around them, meaning the fresh air also helped to keep the room itself and the poor workers somewhat cool. Temperatures could still reach the high 40s in Celsius, that's between 110 and 120 Fahrenheit, but it was better than nothing. The fire in the boilers needed a draft to help suck in the fresh air and burn hotter, and this is where the funnels came in. It was actually all a simple mathematical equation. That many furnaces, and Titanic had 159 of them, needed a certain amount of oxygen for the most efficient burn, and this dictated the size of the funnel's internal flue. It worked just like the chimney of a house, but on an enormous scale. 
The internal flue size was guided by the amount of area that was needed to provide the optimum draft for burning in the furnaces. It's why old steamships funnels were so big and tall. In fact, some were ridiculously so, like the poor old USS Helena here of 1897. So now we know the boilers are burning the coal and being fed a lot of fresh air, but all that soot and smoke generated from the furnaces has to go somewhere, and this is where the uptakes come in. Boiler uptakes were elaborate, branch structures made up of thin, riveted steel plates. Each branch connected to a boiler's smoke box and received the soot, the smoke and the gases directly from the boiler's furnaces. A complex system of internal baffle plates channeled the smoke by creating a draft and ensuring it was heading with force in the same direction at all times. The uptakes, and it cannot be stressed enough, were huge, and so was the amount of smoke pouring through them. As such, a huge chimney was needed to vent this well out of the ship, and here is where the first funnel structure actually comes into play, the lower funnel, spanning the top of the uptakes to the top of the boiler casings. Now the lower funnels were fairly complex in their own right, but suffice it to say they acted as a flue and were split on the inside into sections to ensure optimum draft, even if one of the connected boiler rooms was non-operational at the time. The lower funnels would have been extremely hot to the touch. The gases being vented through them reached about 315 degrees Celsius or 599 degrees Fahrenheit, so they were encased for their entire height by boiler casings which shielded the public spaces from all that heat. This is why the interiors of Titanic featured the occasional odd rectangular structure right in the middle of large public rooms. They were well decorated, so you probably wouldn't really notice them, but they were really the boiler casings which housed the uptakes and the lower funnel, like this one down here on D-Deck in the first class dining saloon and reception room, and this one here from the first class smoking room. Inside the casings, insulation like cotton silicate or cork slabs between one and a half to two inches thick that's about five centimetres, provided some insulation against the great heat. The lower funnels rose to the height of the boat deck deck houses at the top of the ship, and connected to this structure is the one we all know and love, the upper funnel, each some 60 odd feet tall. In fact, to account for the ship's shear, that is, the amount that it sagged in the middle, each funnel was a different height, the two tallest being numbers two and three, so that from afar they would all look to actually be the same height. The funnels were actually deceptively complex in their internal layout, while also being extremely fragile in their construction. In the early days of steam, funnels had basically just been large chimneys that vented the smoke out and were extremely hot to the touch. Remember Napier's paint formula that actually baked itself onto the steel. Well, by Titanic's day, things had changed somewhat. To prevent burns, the funnel was made to be a double-walled structure made of riveted metal plates. Putting some distance between the inner and outer walls would mean the hot gases inside wouldn't heat the outside up as much as it might otherwise. The funnels were built as one piece in the Harland and Wolf shops, winched up onto massive cars and then trundled out to Titanic as she waited at the fitting out wharf. They were craned up one by one and then riveted to the ship's deck plates. We'll get to that in a minute. The inner structure was connected directly to the lower funnel and took in the gases being vented from them and the uptakes. It was spaced apart from the outer structure by metal plates to ensure that the exterior of the funnel would not run as hot, and then to make sure the funnels retained their shape, they were reinforced with bands and stiffening rods at their tops to keep their elliptical cross section. The funnels were made to be as lightweight but strong as possible. The ship was expected to rock and roll all over the place in bad weather and those funnels would have to hold on for dear life. If they were built too heavy or over-engineered, no amount of bracing wires or reinforcement would hold them in place because they were each the height of a five-storey building. The steel plating used to make them was fairly robust, up to a half inch thick, that's about 13 millimetres, but when you consider the thing was as tall as an apartment block you realise they actually weren't too heavy duty at all. In fact, this unique footage shows the Cunard liner Berengaria of Titanic's vintage being scrapped in the 1930s and watch what happens when the funnels lose their support wires and are brought down on the deck. The internal bracing and stiffening rods which have held them in shape for two decades are overcome and the funnel flattens out like a pancake. 
Now, being this delicate and also being extremely tall, the funnels needed some good support to stay mounted to the constantly pitching and rolling ship, which was no easy task. Just imagine the amount of strain they'd be under in a storm. The funnels were connected to the ship's decks by two means. First, the very bottom of the upper funnel structure featured a flange, which was riveted directly to the deck plates. But this alone wouldn't hold the funnels in place. They needed to be supported all around to keep them upright. Now this was the job of the stays and shrouds, galvanised steel wire rope, one and a quarter inch or 3.17 centimetres thick, connected to the funnel's tops with shackles along one of those stiffening bands designed to help maintain the funnel's shape. We mentioned earlier that the funnels were double walled to prevent excess heat, but despite this, believe it or not, when under steam, the funnels would actually lengthen because of how hot it was. There had to be allowance for the strain. Now because of this, the shrouds or cables couldn't be connected directly to the deck because they might snap under the pressure as the funnels became increasingly taller, even if only by inches or mere centimetres. To help with this, thick hemp rope, a lanyard, was woven around the shroud cables and that was attached to pad eyes or shackles on the deck. This way the tension could actually be controlled. In fact, before lighting the boilers on departure, the funnel's shrouds would be actually slackened off by the crews at their lanyard so that the funnels could increase in size and the strain would be eased. The funnels were also a convenient place to mount other important pieces of equipment. Naturally, the ship's huge sets of whistles sat proudly on a platform towards the funnel's tops. Each funnel actually had its own set of these tribell type steam whistles, but only the forward two sets actually functioned. Forward and abaft or behind the funnels were mounted tall waste steam pipes which could be used to vent excess steam out of the boilers if the engines were stopped or if too much steam was being generated. Because the funnels provided a nice, tall surface, various water pipes could be fitted to them too. You can see them in photos, the U-shaped piping runs up about half the height. This means that the water system for the ship's taps was provided with a natural pressure from the gravity afforded by mounting the pipes to the tall funnels. So now we well know what Titanic's funnels were made out of, how they functioned and how they were attached to the ship. But on the night of the sinking, something very strange happened. Those carefully engineered structures came crashing dramatically down. Something had gone horribly wrong. At about 2.15am, all hell had broken loose on the roof of the officer's quarters underneath the ship's first funnel. Second officer Charles Lightoller was working with a group of sailors to prepare an Engelhart collapsible lifeboat for lowering when the ship sank out from underneath his feet with an alarming plunge. It sent a wave rolling up the boat deck, knocking people over and sucking Lightoller down, pinning him up against a ventilator's grating as water rushed in to fill the empty void below. Lightoller was eventually blasted off by a rush of hot air and came to the surface near the collapsible boat that he'd tried to help free. It had floated clean off the deck as the ship sank. He explained himself what happened next at the inquiry when he said, I just held on to something, a piece of rope or something, and was there for a little while, and then the forward funnel fell down. It fell within three or four inches of the boat. It lifted the boat bodily and threw her about 20 feet clear of the ship, as near as I could judge. Now that was an incredible near miss, and extremely fortunate for those who were clinging onto the boat for dear life, but others were not so lucky. Dick Norris Williams was a rising tennis star travelling with his father in first class. They were both swept into the water by the downwards plunge too, and Richard caught sight of his father swimming towards him. He later wrote, I saw one of the four great funnels come crashing down on top of him. Just for one instant I stood there transfixed, not because it had only missed me by a few feet. Curiously enough, not because it had killed my father, for whom I had a far more than normal feeling of love and attachment, but there I was transfixed, wondering at the enormous size of this funnel, still belching smoke. It seemed to me that two cars could have been driven through it side by side. As the funnels came down, we can assume they flattened out now that the bracing was overcome, just as we saw in that footage of Berengaria's scrapping. Even worse was to come though. With the funnels down and detached from their seatings on the deck, a gaping moor was left behind, where according to passenger Eugene Daly, people were sucked in by a torrent of water like flies. It's very grim stuff. As if the ship sinking wasn't already bad enough, the collapsing funnels, and by the way number two went down soon after number one did in a shower of sparks and soot, took quite a few people with them. 
So what had happened? These funnels were designed to weather the worst of the Atlantic storms. The heavy pitching and rolling in huge seas. They were lightly built, heavily braced and reinforced, but still, they had failed. Lightoller presented his own theory at the inquiries when he said, The terrific strain of bringing the after end of that huge hull clear out of the water caused the expansion joint abaft number one funnel to open up. The fact that the two wire stays to this funnel on the after part led over and abaft the expansion joint threw on them an extraordinary strain, eventually carrying away the port wire guy to be followed almost immediately by the starboard one. Instantly the port one parted, the funnel started to fall, but the fact that the starboard one held on a moment or two longer gave this huge structure a pull to that side of the ship. Titanic had two big expansion joints for her upper decks. Bridges actually use these today for similar reasons. Essentially, large structures tend to bend and sag, or lengthen and shorten depending on conditions. For a ship like Titanic, her hull was designed to hog and sag to some extent over big waves. If built too stiffly, it would simply break apart in a heavy sea because there was no easing of the strain. The superstructure on top of Titanic wasn't part of the hull, it was simply attached and would be expected to bend and sag along with it. To help it do this without tearing any of the steel plating that made it up, expansion joints were fitted, breaks in the structure that were separated by a short distance. In passenger spaces, the joint was covered with brass and leather to hide it or at least make it barely noticeable, but with the expansion joints fitted, the superstructure could now flex with the ship's hull. And as Lightoller noted, the immense strain of the sinking was causing Titanic's hull and superstructure atop it to hog. That is, bend downwards, thanks to the effects of gravity pushing the stern down as it was rising higher through the sinking. With the expansion joints opened up, the stays or support cables which supported the after part of the funnel were on the other side of the expansion joint. And his theory suggests that they were suddenly under huge strain and that they failed. But the question has to be asked though, was the parting of those stays the cause of the collapse, or just a symptom? See, Titanic's funnel stays and shrouds were designed to withstand a huge amount of pressure. On the transatlantic run, heavy seas and rolling waves could cause a ship to roll and list either 10, 15 or 20 degrees or more. Now this type of experience was commonplace and ship design had to take it into account. It's worth remembering that Olympic, throughout her entire career, in rough seas and storms, never lost a funnel. And it's hard to imagine that Harland and Wolfe designed the funnels such that the parting of one or two stays could ever possibly cause a collapse in the first place. In fact, the last two funnels on Titanic remained in place high up in the air. Funnel number three had a pair of stays that crossed over an after expansion joint as well, but that funnel remained in place until the ship broke apart underneath it. It shed some doubt on Lightholler's theory. If it was just the effects of gravity and the opened expansion joints at play, shouldn't all four funnels have come down at the same time? Well, the timing of the funnel's collapse actually gives us our first major clue as to what was actually happening. Funnel number one collapsed when water, roaring up the boat deck, met its base, and then number two did the same thing. Clearly, the water was having some effect, but what? At the British inquiry into the disaster, naval architect Edward Wilding, who'd actually helped design the ship, gave his opinion when he said, the funnels are carried from the casings in the way of the comparatively light upper decks, that is the boat and the A deck. When these decks became submerged and the water got inside those houses, the water would rise outside much faster than inside and the excessive pressure on the comparatively light casings, which are not made to take a pressure of that kind, would cause the casing to collapse would take the seating out from under the funnel and bring the funnel down. Now water pressure is capable of terrifying things, as anybody familiar with the effects of Delta P can testify. One foot of water pressure equates to roughly 3.06 kilopascals or less than half a pound per square inch. But as water rushed up the funnel's base as the bow sank, the pressure increased dramatically. At 10 feet, the funnel's base would have been under some 30.6 kilopascals or 4.4 psi of pressure, and the casings and deck houses down on A deck would now be under 92 kilopascals or 13 psi of pressure. Now, what Wilding was suggesting was that the lower funnels and the casings were buckled by the water pressure, and this brought the funnel down too. But the evidence from the wreck suggests otherwise, because the casings and the lower funnel are still all there in fine shape. It seems more likely that water rushing up the boat deck surged around the base of number one funnel and then the pressure began to mount. 
We know the funnel collapsed some time after light hole was surfaced nearby, meaning that the funnel would have had to have sunk for a while and its base would have been at quite a depth when it came down, perhaps it was as deep as 20 feet or 6 meters. With the entire interior of that funnel, the lower funnel and the casings not yet flooded and now under extreme pressures, a structural failure would have been inescapable. It's not implausible to think that water pressure began to buckle the base of Titanic's forward funnels because at 25 feet of depth, the funnel's base would have been under around 11 psi, or 74.5 kilopascals. As the base buckled and the funnel began to topple, excess pressure on the shrouds and the stays would have caused them to snap. To those in the water outside, like Lightoller, it might have looked as if the shrouds and the stays were straining and snapping, causing the funnel to fall, but it was actually the other way around. 11 psi doesn't sound like a lot, but acting on something as big, hollow and lightly built as Titanic's funnels, it seems likely that the ocean's pressure at that depth could have brought them down. We know the water pressure was enough to collapse the Grand Staircase dome cover directly behind the number one funnel almost as soon as it was immersed in water, for example. Today on the wreck, there's no structure there at all, just an open hole where it once sat. Another clue to the water pressure hypothesis is the fate of funnels 3 and 4, which remained attached comfortably, high and dry, despite that ridiculous 20 to 30 degree angle down and the same list to the side that the forward funnels had endured. These funnels only detached during the breakup when the forces of gravity became simply far too much for the structures to endure. Other ships from Titanic's era sank with surprising results. In 1916, Titanic's sister ship Britannic sank after striking a mine off Kia in Greece, and the result was very similar. Like Titanic, her funnels seemed to collapse one by one in turn, with survivor Corporal J. War stating that as each funnel touched the water, it was torn off just like paper. Curiously though, just a year prior, the liner RMS Lusitania had sunk too, but her funnels remained attached as they were pulled underwater. Surely they must have been under similar forces as Titanic and Britannic's. Well, even though she was some 10,000 tons smaller than Titanic, Lusitania's funnels were even taller. But interestingly, they were actually braced with double sets of shrouds and stays at two different levels compared to Titanic's one. If the bases of Lusitania's funnels began to crumple and fail, it could be that the much greater number of support cables was able to take up the strain and keep them in place. On top of that, differences in the makeup of the funnels, the plating thickness, the amount of stiffeners and internal reinforcement, it all might have meant that Titanic and Britannic's funnel designs were just more susceptible to failing and collapsing once subjected to water pressures than Lusitania's ever were. That's not a fault on the part of the designers though. No ship's funnel would ever need to endure that kind of punishment in normal life. Titanic's funnels are an incredibly iconic part of the ship's exterior, so much so that just the sight of any four-funneled ship will invariably bring up the story of Titanic. Show your regular person a photograph of Aquitania, and chances are they'll call it Titanic. The number and size of a ship's funnels rose to symbolize that vessel's size and power, but in time they fell out of favor, possibly thanks to the Titanic disaster in part, but mostly due to changing tastes. In the 1920s, ship's funnels became smaller and more streamlined. There's just something so Victorian and industrial about the tall, straight funnels of Titanic's day, almost exactly like a factory chimney. As Art Deco took hold, ship's funnels shrank in size and became more shapely thanks to liners like Germany's Bremen and the USA's SS America. Today, ships still have funnels, but they're almost more of an afterthought. Ships aren't packed with dozens of boilers anymore, only diesel engines, meaning a single funnel is usually enough to do the job. Few could be considered iconic, save maybe for that, of the Queen Mary II, whose funnel shape was designed specifically to be short enough to fit under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge in New York, while featuring a large wind scoop to make sure that the smoke lifts high over the heads of the ship's passengers. I shot this footage myself last year, and I can tell you from experience that it definitely works. In a fitting touch, the funnel of this ship, the last and the largest ocean liner ever built, is finished in a variation of Cunard Red, the same colour that Napier had developed all the way back in the early 1800s. Today on the wreck of Titanic, there is very little sign of those once proud and towering funnels. They broke free of the ship, but their shrouds and stays remained attached, causing havoc as they ripped up and down the deck, those one and a quarter inch, 3.17 centimetre thick cables tearing lifeboat davits and equipment clean off the decks. 
The funnels themselves likely flattened out as they hit the water, like we saw with Berengarias. Now, their only remains are some nearly unrecognisable piles of tangled plating and pipes on the ocean floor. It's hard to believe these majestic things once towered high over the ocean in the days when Titanic was the newest, finest ship in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.